Athos, the next evolution of load training. My name is Dr. Mark Kovacs. I'll be leading this uh, presentation today. My background is a performance physiologist, a strength and conditioning professional, and over the last decade or so, a sports scientist. Uh, I was formerly the director of the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. I was an executive with PepsiCo in long-term research and innovation. Prior to that, directed the sports science and coaching education for the US Tennis Association. And over the last few years, have consulted with more than 20 professional teams, national sports governing bodies, and top division one athletic departments in the areas of performance training, uh, high performance culture and structure, and areas of sports science integration within the medical teams and also the performance teams in these various organizations. As well as that, I'm a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine uh, and a certified strength and conditioning specialist through the NSCA. So very excited to talk today on the topic of load and load monitoring and how it impacts our athletes. So from a standpoint of load, one of the big areas is how do we define the term load? We have external load and we have internal load. Most of the time when most of us talk about loading an athlete, we're talking external load. How much weight do they lift? How far do they run? Uh, how much distance do they cover? What are their speed changes? Things like that. That's really, really important data. Very, very important metrics for us to analyze. But it's really only telling us a very small piece of the overall puzzle and by itself is really not enough information to make significant decisions about playing time, work to rest ratios, uh, and how that impacts performance and potentially injury as well. So the concept here is how do we improve athletic availability rates? So le le less injuries, less fatigue, and better performance. So we know that nearly every team out there uses some form of training load monitoring. And this has been occurring for many years. The challenge is in many leagues and many teams, uh, injury rates have increased. For example, in the NFL, injury rates have increased over the last few years. Uh, in other sports, we're seeing similar trends. So even with all this information that we're gathering, we're still not seeing a huge reduction in injury rates. So that tells us there's a lot of factors that contribute to that, as we all know, but we've got to do a better job. What we're currently doing is not really good enough. So what are we missing? It's how do we assess the training load is really the challenge. Uh, in most team sports, GPS is one form of monitoring for external load. Uh, accelerations and decelerations are a big part of that. Uh, it gives us a window into what the athlete is doing from an external load perspective. Many of us utilize heart rate as well. That gives us a picture of the internal load from a cardiovascular energy standpoint. However, there are significant limitations with both options. Uh, one is that it really just gives us one piece of the puzzle. So we need to integrate multiple pieces to get a better sense of what's happening. Uh, and here are some studies listed that really go into great review. Uh, if you want some of these, I'm happy to share them with you. Please email me at mark at kovacsinstitute.com and I'd be happy to share uh, the data that we collect as well. But also I teach one of the few graduate classes in sport technology as well as recovery in sport. Uh, and we review the latest literature on the topics of loading, monitoring, uh, athlete recovery and regeneration as well. So from a challenges and limitations standpoint, these are just a few of the studies um, that highlight where some of the challenges are with what we currently all sort of do from a load monitoring external perspective. Um, we know there are significant issues. Um, Partly, there's some error, which some error we can live with because we get real-time data. The challenge is how much error are we willing to live with uh, and how well do we actually perform um, the monitoring, meaning do we use the same sensors on each athlete on the same, same athlete setup? Because if we don't, that alone can make significant differences. And that's just one example. The faster an athlete runs, 
the more challenges we see as well. So we've got to make sure we understand the challenges and the limitations. We know that there's a need to get great external load, um, but there is a dissociation between external load and internal load. Uh, we've known that for decades when it comes to heart rate and RPE, as opposed to speed, say, on a treadmill. Um, we're seeing some, some interesting information regarding the disconnect sometimes between the GPS data and EMG data in the lab situation. So we're seeing muscle activation challenges that we may not be picking up you know, in, with, when we're looking just at GPS data. Uh, so it's really important to understand what we may be missing. So this brings us to what we all typically monitor currently, um, just general training load. And everyone uses slightly different metrics for how they determine their training load that's important to them. Uh, as we can see on the y-axis here, we're looking at a specific uh, load metric. This could be a distance times an RPE for a total week. This could be a uh, distance divided by a wellness score that you may be taking. Uh, this may be a combination of multiple things, but in general, a general training load looks something like this, and it's usually a distance or acceleration uh, type chart. Incorporating something like ATHOS, and we actually utilize uh, an internal load metric like uh, surface muscle EMG, this allows us to isolate a little bit better and see where we start getting loading with specific muscle groups. So blue is, the, is a glute load, uh, red is the hamstring, green is the inner quad load, and then yellow is the outer quad load. So this allows us to get a better picture of where in this loading mechanics and loading metrics are we seeing the discrepancies or the extra or less than optimal loads. And again, by itself, this is a very important piece of the puzzle because we start seeing that if increasing GPS numbers or increasing load, external load goes up, yet hamstring activation on the left hamstring goes down or stabilizes with a big spike in the right hamstring, that gives us a real clear window of, hey, the right hamstring is struggling with this extra load. Without knowing that, we don't know if that extra load is good or bad. In that example I just gave you, one hamstring was fine with the extra load and the other hamstring wasn't. And that's where we see issues arise. So here's an example of cause and effect. This is when we uh, create our graph and create a z-score potentially, uh, where every week is equivalent to a one. And based on that, as our standard, we see where does the muscle activation per week occur. So do we see shifts in how different muscle groups are activated on a weekly basis once we standardize through? So again, there's a lot of different ways that we can look at data. Uh, this is just one great example that allows us to look at a weekly stress of the um, muscle groups that we're talking about here and seeing the shift over time and which muscle groups are doing better or worse. The greatest example in this scenario is our hamstring load. We can see in week four, we have relatively low hamstring load um, and we have relatively high you know, quad load. Uh, that may be due to the type of training. That may be more gym-based training, less running. Um, and then it could be a result as we go through weeks 11, 12, 13, we see a lot more hamstring load. Uh, and again, by itself, this doesn't tell us everything, but it just gives us a sense that we're seeing a change in hamstring activation over the course of the weeks, which if that was our objective, maybe we're doing a prehab program and we're trying to get those hamstrings to activate more and more and more, that's a great sign. If this was an example of games, for example, and each week was game data, this probably isn't what we want to see. We, want to, we don't want to see a continual increase in hamstring activation uh, week by week by week in game situations. Here's an example of just general compensation patterns. So real life data uh, that shows you know, how that impacts left versus right legs and then total. So we're looking at the combined load. 
So we can look at training load from an internal perspective individually based on legs and even down to the muscle groups but also you can pull it together and look at internal training load as a whole, as a global metric. And this can be very, very beneficial to pass alongside with your external training load data, your wellness scores, your recovery scores, to get a real clear picture of what's happening with your athletes. For example, just in a football program, total versus hamstring workload example, so real life data, uh, looking at hamstring load and seeing a dramatic increase and or variation in movement patterns. Played 100% of the games um, in, in this situation. So again, we can see a total work. So what was that activation for the entire lower body? Or we can compare that to total work overall with our external load metrics that we want to use. And then we also see our uh, hamstring activation, bicep femoris is what we're looking at here specifically. So we get a real clear picture of how as total load increases or decreases, what's the impact on hamstring load. So very, very useful, valuable information in this example. So most of you use some form of acute to chronic ratio when you're looking at your data. And again, there's a lot of options when we're talking on the acute to chronic ratio um, scale. You know, most common is the current week divided through by the previous three weeks. Uh, that's a relatively common um, ratio that most people are using due to some great data that's out there showing some linkages. However, we need to be cautious about over relying on those ratios. One, the data is in its infancy in the scheme of things. Two, every individual is different and we need to realize that we can't use blanket data like that to make significant decisions for each individual athlete. The goal of the acute to chronic ratio should be to give yourselves a ratio and a range to analyze. And when an athlete's significantly inside or outside that range, we've got to ask ourselves, are we providing the right amount of volume, the right amount of load? The beauty is we can use an accrued chronic ratio example just like we're probably using on external load metrics currently, we can use on internal load metrics as well. And we're just looking to see, is there a spike in intensity, in activation, in other metrics that we're looking at, or is there too much of a drop as well? Remember, a lot of athletes are undertrained these days. This was a big problem in a lot of sports where whether it's the Players Association having more um, strength and reducing number of training hours, which in the short term sounds like a good idea. Um, less training, less potential injury risk because you're out there less time. However, we still require these athletes to perform at the highest levels in game speed. So if we would use training time, yet still require the same amount of effort in games, we're actually increasing our injury risk because they're not prepared, they're not resilient enough, they're not tough enough to perform in those game speed environments. So we have to be very careful with under training and we're seeing some significant cases of under training. And that's one argument why maybe some of these injury rates have not gone down the way I think a few people would have liked with some of these new rules that have been put in place. But also in a lot of teams where individuals are looking at data alone and maybe pulling back too much or being too conservative with some of their athletes and not really training them enough, well enough. So again, something to think about with you and your athletes. So hopefully this information was useful, provided a quick window into some of the differences between external load and internal load, uh, talking about movement and muscular stress. The goal here is to make better and more efficient decisions when it comes to athlete training and athlete recovery. And the whole overall goal is to improve player availability and performance so that the teams can perform at a higher level as a result of each individual athlete performing at their best. Again, my name is Dr. Mark Kovacs. I was super excited to present today. And if you, anyone wants any further information on this topic, feel free to email me uh, or visit me on Twitter as well at mkovacsphd. And again, just want
ethos for the work they're doing, trying to help athletes and performance staff and high performance directors improve the quality of training and recovery.